think it's time we get to the bottom of the steep house issues. So I think we're going to just make our way back around here. So the Trail of the Green Mountain don't seem to really trust me. Actually, I'm not entirely certain how I'm going to gain their trust, to be truthfully honest with you. I would like to get their permission to go to High Island, but if it's too much of, you know, a pain, what does it know isn't going to hurt them? Because I feel like we're getting close at the moment. I think we mentioned at the end of the last episode that I kind of have this as one of my tasks right now, and I kind of want to work through the center of the map at some point just to try and find out what is it actually in there. Because I feel fairly well equipped now. We've got the axe. Oh, sorry, we had the axe. We sold the axe. But we have blinding powder. We have... Actually... Oh, we've got the horn that scares beasts away now, right? We have the crossbow, so I wouldn't mind buying a few quivers, maybe. Is that something I should be looking at? Where's my bow? We, still, we have seven quivers, but we are kind of stacked for gear right now. Anyway, I wonder if I can go into secluded residence, or will she make me wait? Straight to the house. Uh, she will only sell me a spirit rock. You know what, let's see what she thinks about work in the city. You glance her absent eyes. She has shown you signs of trust. But you won't convince her with just a smile. The more you'll learn about the peninsula, the more arguments you'll have at your disposal. I've got something important to discuss. She puts her stuff away and looks at your ear, frowning. I take... I, I, sorry, are you taking off your mask? I don't want to threaten her. You know what, let's be playful. It, it's getting cold. I'd rather keep my clothes on. A grimace of disgust makes you move away. Don't even try it. And just in case, take a walk with me. Just so you don't get too comfortable. Uh, while we're heading toward the gate, I tell her about my deal with the guild. You mention the merchants, the officials, and the high status of the enchanters amongst the city folk. She lets you speak without interruption, observing your surroundings. Still barefoot and with a worn robe, she looks like a cook in a herbal garden. You approach the pond and she takes a deep breath. The geese in the distance are as grey as her irises. We're just in time. The air is still fresh. Her tone is hard to decipher and she keeps taking long pauses. I've built so much and over so many years. Now you want me to tie myself to some coin holders? Or even worse, to leave all of this? She waves toward a residence. Behind? You know how easy it is to suddenly disappear in his land, just think about a Styrian. You know best how much you've learned since the day of the day you enchanted the old chisel. In this city you could speak with other masters, learn how to read scrolls, you'd unlock your potential. The peninsula is a dangerous place with a little help to offer. I know that better than anyone. The city folk will start negotiations with the tribes as well. You don't have to be left out. Or can you be sure the monks won't turn the their neighbours against you. Yeah, I think we go for the last one. She cocks her head to the side. Mm, so far they've done naught to hurt me. I went as far away from them as I could have. I bother no one. Oh, I promised the monks to not betray them. Oh, come on. I wanted to betray them. Okay, I may have screwed something over the monks then. Uh, you have to be left out. You're close to the crag behind the residence, observing the heavy golem that's lifting large boulders and moving them aside. So far, it's formed a small pile of rocks that resembles its own limbs. You describe the support you've already gathered, as well as your further plans. I can either face the avalanche or wait for it to bury me, she summarizes, then lowers a voice. No one is going to honor my own will. Okay. The Peninsula is a dangerous place. You mentioned the monsters you've encountered, the destruction of Steep House, the rumours about the undead, the troll from the old camp in Hag Hills, the plague, the missing hunters, her own fear of the bandits. She hesitates still. I guess it ought to trust you on this one. You know what? It, it, easy it is to suddenly disappear in this land, think of Asterion. Uh, I'd rather not. She rubs her arms above her elbows, as if to warm herself up. I just hope he's all right. Okay, I have to go through all of them, I guess. Uh, you can speak to other masters. 
Using bits of knowledge you've read in old codices, you mention a few respected enchanters working in the city, as well as a unique interest in magic that helps the fishers and wall builders. You mention the golemic limbs aiding workers, candles that last for days, helmets that help sailors during storms. She observes the birds flying towards the eastern mountains, listening carefully. Other masters. She tastes your words as she repeats them. I haven't needed them so far, but... She doesn't finish instead giving you a kind smile. What's your decision? You answer a few more questions about the city, and her doubtful glances are slowly replaced with polite nods. So all you have is your word for now, but that's better than naught. For a few breaths, you listen to the branches and grass trampled by your feet. Finally, you see her looks in the distance and gestures for you to follow her back to the gate. I'll speak with your puppeteers, and I've got a little gift for them. A gift? A sign of goodwill. She waves it off. Let me gather my thoughts. You reach the front yard, greeted by Shermin's curious snort. The enchantress enters the house briefly and brings you what looks like a plank made of rock shards. Tell them I made them this ten years. Sorry, I made them. Yeah, tell them I made them this ten years ago. It should be enough to convince them that my golems are real. But what is it? Well, she invites you to stretch out your hand and grabs your fingers with her own. Her touch is cold. A keepsake from the time I needed to build my first sentinel. The rocks clench your skin from your wrist to your shoulder like a sleeve. Your arm gets slightly heavy, but the sensation fades away. Don't shake anyone's hand while wearing this. Her words carry both pride and melancholy. It takes time to get used to my spell's strength. To take it off, just give it a rapid pull here. She grabs it close to your shoulders, and the golem glove falls away. Even though the rocks aren't connected to each other in any visible way, they keep their general shape. As long as you don't push any of the parts too fiercely, the pneuma will hold. Can I use it in combat? You better, a brief chuckle. Your punches will surprise you, and we need you back in the city and safe. I've become one punch man. This is the greatest gift that anyone could give me. I will never betray you. I would rather slaughter the monks in the monastery. Okay. Let's head around this way, I guess. See if the pelt will give me a free meal. They will. Delicious. Uh, what have you got right now? Do I want to buy some quarrels? Not really. Seven's probably good enough for now. Hmm. Uh, I approach the guards. Hmm. Hmm. Right, I'll wash my shell with our new perfume, remember? Clove perfume. Right, steep house. Three fish. This place is a fishy gold mine. 45 minutes. How long? Four hours. Okay, let me go and sell these fish while I'm here. Honestly, would you like to purchase the last fish? Because it's going to go off before I get back here. No? Alright, see you later. Right, I got it for a bit. I entered the village. The tailor doesn't need anything the druidess. I don't need healing right now, so farewell. Ah! I need to decide what to do with what I've learned about Steep House. You're standing in the middle of the island, taking a good look at the village. The locals follow their daily routines. Children are playing tag, the trees are turning golden brown. You listen to the humming creak in the singing old woman. Yet you can see what's beneath all that. A home to raiders who led dozens of humans to their death. If you decide to act, you'll only have one shot at this. Starting a storm without a firm support of the locals will paint you as a threat. If Vice was able to keep her power despite her deeds, she surely has strong support. And she may not yield to you even if openly confronted. Okay, we're not ready. Elpis, I need your help. What's your sense of necromancy? She grabs the staff with both hands. The Ewo can spit onto the order of things. And time and nature. When held by human spells, they only grow, waiting for the numer of corruption to cover their bones. 
They're really simple and will never be forgotten. They will hunt for those we care for and they will drink their blood. Her face hides any emotion, her voice is monotonous. But her fingers are getting pale. The curse of necromancy does not enter our gatherings. Tell me about your faith. She tilts her head to the right and looks directly into your eyes. Oh, what do you want to know? How do you feel about other religions? What would you only feel, have to feel about them? If they let us live, we will knee strike first. A preacher was here once, when I was but a teen. Her eyes get a bit more cloudy. I see that one could take the tablets and grow upon them, but the right burns the freedom of others, and their followers build their great dead temples from the skulls of those who do not listen. We request trust, knee slavery. Uh, the right supposed to have the tablets, what about you? For a moment you think she's not sh sure how to answer, but you then realise that she's humming to herself silently. She raises her hand and gestures for you to look around. The world of our ancestors was neither the same as the one we see. They had their truth, we have ours. Stories come from humans, the animals think nothing of them, yet prosper. What does it mean to be a druid? To be worthy of trust, our elders have to trust that we'll master our shells under their guidance and use them to strengthen all of us. Our neighbours have to trust that we're worthy of their food, ever if we do no work with our hands. The creatures need to trust that we deserve to enter their woods. She observes you for a bit and her, f and her fingers tap on her staff. This trust would never be put in an outsider. Let's change the topic. Why do you speak to the entire group? Uh, she steps away tilting her staff towards the other jury to look at you gently. This name master amongst us. I've answers for our neighbours and I know how to guide them. That's all. For now I'm trusted, but I'm near above anyone, and I take upon myself the burdens of daily life from the shoulders of the elders. One day my soul will get cloudier, or ever lost in madness, like my mother's before me. Then my lips will be sealed, and a better shell will take my place. You can't tell if her eyes show sadness or relief. Alright, see you later. Okay, I'm not ready to deal with Steep House, apparently. Instead, what I think I'm going to do, because I really like this cushy deal for, you know, free rent. I think I'm going to go in the middle of the map. I am now one punch man. I think we can deal with this. Possibly should have grabbed a few more rations, but... Let's see if we can find Glaucia. I travel as far east as I can. With the gate unlocked on both sides, it takes a little effort. The forest gives way to rocks and green hills, but amongst the tall trees are numerous monkeys, sitting in small groups, loud yet shorter than half, sorry, shorter than half your size. They distort the green leaves with red, brown, white, and blue fur. As you approach their territory, their excitement grows. Actually, we're not One Punch Man. We're like Jax from Mortal Kombat, right? We're Jax. We're a rocky Jax. They climb up and down the trunks, sway on vines, jump between branches or hang down, putting to use their long tails. They throw at you countless angry glances and grunts, but also cones, branches and chestnuts. A piece of their fresh feces lands close to Shadowmane, but the pack's aim is rather miserable. Maybe the dragon horn will scare them off. The dragon horn! You press the horn to your lips and after the first failed attempt, you fill the woods with a terrifying shout of a monster. The screams of the troop gets higher and whinier and the creatures flee through the trees and either hide behind the trunks or observe the woods from dense leaves. When some of the monkeys turn toward you again, you're already crossing the path. They give you a worried, respectful glance. I ride forward, holding the horn in the air. Ooh. Every minute or so, you get lost in the dense woods. When possible, you stick to the remains of the beaten path, clearing the overgrown thicket that blocks your way. But it would take more travels to sustain such a trail. The land around you may lack greens, but is far from being empty. The fallen boughs and dead stumps are slowly devoured by ants and mushrooms. A web-like labyrinth of wooden walls. While the white termites, larger than your hands, 
continue their never-ending march. Their guards notice your presence, but simply form a warning line in front of their workers. Holy shit, termites inside of your hands, that's horrible. The trees are tall in the temple in the city, with trunks resembling the legs of giants. The shadows they cast are like a carpet, and the few beams of light nourish the sparse bushes and ferns. The only plants that aren't choked by the rotting late summer leaves, shaped like two squares as large as your face. Now that I'm more familiar with this part of the forest, I may be able to find a smoother path. Nice. The road is bright, empty, surrounded by sparsely growing trees, gentle hills and meadows. It leads you to a cairn, a pile of rocks ranging in size from your abdomen to your fist. Those are quite a few tiny pebbles. A narrow, hardly passable trail leads south, but likely won't survive another year without travellers. Where, where am I on the map? Oh my god, it's just all over the place. Uh, I take a look at the car. It's wider than two people standing side by side and taller than Shadowmane. The grass surrounds it tightly. It must be years old, but could just as well be older than any village in the north. You find rocks in many colours, including red, cream, white, black, and blue, and many dotted or mixed ones. While the cairn stays firm beneath your touch, it would be easy to shatter it with a pickaxe or a single swipe of a dragon. You also notice these pieces of old chicken bones pressed amongst the rocks. Unfortunately, no coins. I step away. Look, let's look at the narrow path south. You grab Shadowmane's lead and use your axe to get through the branches and tall grass. After a few minutes, you reach a colourful meadow with orange, red and white flowers, as tall as a wheat field. Their late summer scent lures all sorts of insects, as well as tiny birds. The path ends at the edge of the glade. A bird or an ape may get me from above. I move forward but keep an eye on the closest trees. A cat could leap at me from amongst the flowers. I keep looking around. I observe the ground. The snake may bite my leg. Or I don't trust this place. I turn back. Mm. I don't think it's going to be a bird or an ape. In part because we've already had that encounter. A cat though I could see. I'm going to look for cats. Oh god. You tell your mountain tree and tread forward carefully, keeping your eyes and weapons high. Soon the nearest birds flee from your scream. You reach to your side to look down. A hundred-legged worm, as wide as your fist and maybe three feet long, has crawled underneath your gamson and chewed off a bit of your flesh. What? You pull by its tail and stretch out your arm. The creature wriggles in the air, incapable of bending its shell enough to scratch your hand. It's red, covered with armour made of plates. You throw it away and touch the hole that you left in your clothes. There's hardly any blood. I seek anything of value amongst the plants. You, your step for, sorry, your steps force the mice and insects to spread, but your presence remains hardly noticed by the colourful life around you. Knowledge. I pick all sorts of interesting herbs and add them to the bag with ingredients, or I look for the flower for you to see it. You know what? I'm not going to use my knowledge. I want you to see this flower. After a few minutes, sorry, after a few minutes among the grasses, you move uphill to get a better view. And it just happens to be a spot where orange tulips grow. They don't resist your knife. I can return to the cairn. Wonderful. Continue my journey. Your eyes wander between the wall of trees and shrubs on one side and the dirty pond on the other. The road itself is wide, covered with soggy logs that keep the ground from turning into mud. It's breaking under your mount's hooves, letting out what sounds like a sigh of relief. The water insufferably stinks of carrion, and is covered with a blanket of green plants and white flowers that draw countless buzzing insects. Even a horse should not drink from this. Shadowing tries to get familiar with the unusual pavement, and speeds up to jump over a fallen trunk blocking your path. Once it lands, it breaks one of the logs in half. I thought for a second it was... It breaks its leg in half. I was about to be upset. Soon after, you reach a massive black saurian resting on the ground, enjoying the light at the edge of the forest. It seems to be ignoring your presence, and once again, Shadow encounters. I'll trust its instincts. Once the monster raises its head, you're already in the air. The beast pushes itself away from the ground with its forelimbs, 
trying to catch any chunk of flesh with its massive jaws. Will you safely hit the ground and return to the trot slowly? Did I jump over the saurian? Why would I not just go around it? I pay attention to the dead trees sticking out of the pond. They look similar to that saurian. Where are we on the map now? Holy moly, we've nearly made it across the centre of the map. The colours of leaves range from greens to purples and overwhelm me with shadows. The stems of the shrubs twisted in all directions, seeking the slightest scraps of sunlight. The trees are not too tall, but their trunks are as wide as buildings. The neglected road has been carved into the thicket, an inch at a time. A corridor of plants with a floor made of pebbles give way to sapling and vines. From time to time you pass by many turns, relics left by roaming dragons, unicorns and trolls. Some of them are still used by beasts, boars, striped cats or packs of goblins. The birds are sharing their songs as cheerful as ever, when necessary to clear any thickets in Shadow Man's way. You reach a gap in the tunnel of plants. The meadow nourishes a lonely tree, growing in the shadow of a rocky hill surrounded by humble grasses. Near the tree roots, a wolf without fur is feasting on a human corpse unaware of your presence. I have to look at the corpse. I have to know if this is one of the hunters. You don't see much from afar. It's in one piece with blood-soaked clothing torn to pieces, indistinguishable from the loose flaps of skin. It has no sacks, bags or equipment, but you spot a trail of blood leading to the trees. The creature must have dragged the shell from the deeper woods. The beast raises its head, its ears are shaking. I look around. You see no other creatures. The road in front of you is passable. The birds in the sky seem harmless. The beast turns its head towards you. Its eyes are like shining charcoal. Uh, I look at the wolf. It's standing on all fours, crouching forward with blood dripping from its massive canines. Its head and especially its jaw are wide and long like those of a horse. Its brown shell is muscular with pronounced shoulder blades, the hair resembling your arms and a tuft of black fur at the end of its foot long tail. The beast turns its head towards you, its eyes are like shining charcoal. I look at the tree. The beast turns towards you, fixing its eyes on your palfrey. Its long mouth is covered in blood. After maybe two breaths, it moves, speeding up, ready to strike. We're fighting this thing. I repair my axe and shield. Shadowmane takes a few steps forward, too scared to stay at your side, but too smart to enter the forest all by itself. Uh, I'm going to throw blinding powder into its snout. The cloud hits the creature as it speeds up, making it stumble. It leaps away with a whimper that sounds like boiling water. It was fast enough to turn its head away, saving one of its eyes, but it spends a few breaths trying to rub its head onto the grass, unaware it will likely face the rest of its life half blind. Holy shit, I thought this was... Oh, to be fair, we're probably going to kill this thing. I prepare myself for a clash. The beast walks around and tries to shake the powder off its head. You can't tell anything from its black eye. Your foe keeps its distance, hesitant to strike. Uh, don't throw the fucking axe, that's a crazy. I'll bait into biting my armoured forearm, then chop into its side. I forgot. We can go into Jack's mode. Oh, it tears through your jacket as if it's nothing. But you've got enough time to sink your blade between its ribs. It lets you go and prepares itself for another attack, ignoring its blood. Uh, I clash with it, cutting it once it gets closer. The beast jumps at you and pins you to the ground, but not before you cut into its side. You push away its throat with your forearm, saving your neck, while you uh, spasmodically move the blade up and down side to side. You can't catch a breath. Finally, the wolf's guts spill onto your fingers, and its hind legs stop moving. It withers down your arms, still warm, but its eyes no longer blink. The blood covers your hands and clothes. I push the carcass off me. You take a couple of deep, slow breaths and stretch out your arms. Shadowman is looking around, stepping in place. You approach it slowly, speaking with a soft voice to calm it down, and grab the water skin to wash your hands. I look at the beast. The inch-long canines stick out of the saurian-like maw, its eyes are like two pieces of shining charcoal. A male, too large to carry around, too skinny to cut away with a nice piece of meat. Uh, I cut myself a trophy. It takes a couple of strong hits with your simple axe, but the golem glove helps you a lot. 
You grab the head by the ear, avoiding its eyes, and let the creak of blood spill into the grass. You rotate it around for a bit, shaking off as much of the flesh and scraps of brain as you can. You attach it to your saddle, hoping it won't besmear Shadow Mane. At least it doesn't stench. Yet. You have a day or two before it starts to rot. I examine the corpse. Parts of its chest, face and neck and arms were turned into a red mush. The wolf didn't break any bones, not even the ribs. The first worms start to crawl over its blood-soaked clothes. The human was a male with brown skin and short black hair. His brown pants and green jacket were made of dyed leather. Inside the left ear you spot a trinket made of animal bone, which contrasts with the dark skin and lures your eyes away from the blood. Knowing Efren's descriptions, you have no doubts you found Vashgal. Remove the earring. With a few slashes of, sorry, splashes of water, you wash the cold blood off your hands and the knife. Did I cut it out of his ear? Whatever, it's a corpse. And we're going to burn it. There's plenty of birds gathered at the edge of the meadow, waiting for you to walk away from their next meal. The larger beast will come soon. You don't have much time. Surely not enough to make a pyre. My ancestor would ask me to set human remains on fire. I'll spend a few minutes doing the bare minimum. You grab the only boot worn by the corpse and drag it toward the middle of the trail. Then spend some time surrounding it with dry sticks and grasses and cover with a single dry bough. The guts are likely to put out the foot fire soon after your departure, but maybe you'll be lucky. You light up a simple torch and set fire to a couple of promising spots. As the skin and hair start to burn, Shadowman gives you a weird look. You realize that it hasn't used any of this time to graze. I'll leave the torch here, I'll prepare another one before I go to sleep. I ride away. The stream ahead can be crossed by a humble ford made of hundreds of rocks that used to reach from the bottom of the surface, but it's now partially demolished, either by time or a living creature. For a rider, crossing it won't be much of a problem, but most travelers would have to take off their pants and shoes. Moving an entire wagon would pose quite a challenge. The water is clean, the banks are low. A good watering spot for Shadow Mane. I could spend some time gathering the larger rocks and throwing them into the water, or for now I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to ignore it for now. I am on low health, I don't want to risk it. Ooh. The path leads you uphill. The trees are getting sparser and smaller, and more sunlight touches the ground. The signs of human touch are rare. The lone large boulder surely draws attention. You can't guess its age, but the pass around suggests it was passed plenty of times already. The remains of red paint are covering the eastern side. It's the same message as the one you saw at the southern crossroads. Do not enter. Danger ahead. You look behind you. Uh, thank my ancestors for keeping my senses sharp. I patched Shadow Mane. It did well. I sigh with relief. Who cares about signs? I made it. I deserve rest and a good bed after that. I thank my ancestors for keeping my senses sharp. Oh, you tried to repeat the short ritual. One should clasp their hands and touch their eyes. Or was it a nose? You start gesturing, hoping that the muscles will lead you through the confusion. But it only distracts you further. You're beset by the memories of blood and eyes. You look around whenever you hear a rustle. Even your breath gets faster. You shake your head and grasp the reins firmly. I travel to the guest gate to the west. We did it. We haven't done it. You're standing at the fort, still as challenging for travelers as it was when you found it. A large fish is swimming one side to the other by nimbly squeezing through the rocks. Oh, I have to deal with this, I guess. All right, I guess I'll gather some rocks then. How long? An hour should be enough to cover at least the, half the gaps. We'll spend an hour here. You let Shadow Man graze and drink by the stream. You wander along the edge of the dark forest on one side and a colorful meadow on the other and seek the rocks small in your head. Kind of makes you tired quickly. After you're done, the deepest holes are now filled by your rocks. For now, it's enough. I move on. I'm not messing about here. 
God damn, there's still more. I thought we were out. You're near the same part of the forest where you encountered the corpse-eating beast. Oh, I said the west gate, didn't I? The rocky hills are green with colorful flowers and lively buzzing of insects. You seek any threats hidden in the tall grass. You notice a single soul standing on a distant rock ledge. They call you with a gesture. Whom do I see? It's a man in unlaced black gambeson. It's glossy as band, right? Covering a simple cloth shirt. He has the short, dark hair of a labourer. Neither tall nor short. You see no weapons. He's standing near the entrance to a cave and keeps looking around. Even once he looks back at you, he gestures no more, just waits. Helping out lost travellers about the road runs job, I dismantle each other. No, it's a trap. Get out of here. I won't stop for gossip in the middle of the wilderness. No, 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 no. I, no, 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 no. Can, can I go here? Ugh. Can I go here? I fucked up so badly. Not knowing my cardinal directions. Shadowman stops and sets back. Right in the middle of the road lies a cat the size of a bear, lapping the nasty pond water. You look around, but there are no other monsters. The thick fur is the colour of tree trunks, with black spots on its side and back, and glimpses of cream on the tail and the head. You notice scars spread around its shell, left by claws, tusks, and fangs of its victims. The hind paws are large on your head. You need a whole squad to overcome such a creature. I can't face the beast, I pull the reins gently. If it's here to drink, maybe it's not hungry. We ride to the side quickly. No, I just can't face the beast. Shadowing gladly turns around. You ride deeper into the woods. We won't reach the other time anytime soon. I ride to the eastern entrance. I can put more rocks here. For now, ignore the rocks. I will deal with this later. Why am I not allowed to go here? Oh, I can. You just have to click on it. That's pretty troll, honestly. The watchtower is blending in with the wilderness slowly. There are small creatures ahead of you, not larger than the hair, running from one side of the road to the other. Before you get to the crossroads, they vanish amongst the shrubs and bushes, which are now rustling and shaking disquietingly. Okay, let's go back to the secluded le residence. Go into the house. I brought you flowers. Her eyes widen as she moves close to you, and I've got your dragons here. Her outstretched hand is shaking. Uh, they aren't good for you, you know. Well, here you go. You know what? We're not here to lecture her. Here you go. Fine job, fine job. She says quietly, examining the petals carefully. Uh, I go outside. Are we done? I think we're done with her quest lines then, for now. Maybe I could have helped her more, but... You know, she she's a grown woman. She's turned me into a superhero. Right, 5 minutes 45. Let me go to Howlersdale. We're going to sleep here. This will recover me a little bit of health. News about the peninsula. Ah! The creeks have suffered quite a blow. Three of the best hunters either died or disappeared. Severino Garrox tries to get an edge by paying messengers to avoid your village. Uh, she seems to be addicted to something. Help us. Honestly, I'm done with you, I think. And you just have linen fabric, a valuable commodity. And you'll buy the bone earring, the hair pelt, oh, also the head of the beast. I'll give you a ring for it. <laughs> you take the tray to your bags and show them the head of the beast that you face in the heart of the forest. Tis uglier than my grandma. Nay, soul hair will hang it on the wall. I'll give you a ring for it. Working it will take time and... Who knows if we can ever sell it. No, I'll, I'm going to take it to the Greeks, people. Forget it. Okay, nothing. I walk away. I leave the square. I talk to the tailor. I need your services. 
please repair my gambeson. Thank you very much. I won't worry about the outfit repairs. Good luck. Elpis doesn't need anything else. See you later. Okay, as the fish trap had any luck, I'm too late. I will set the trap again. Let's go to the creeks. Okay, uh, Efren, about the hunters. Something bad happened to Vashkel. This time he listens patiently, knowing you're saying as much as you can. So you don't really know what happened, just that their shell was in the woods. It gives you a long look, but finally nods. Any evidence? I took this earring from their shell. He observes it for a few moments and lets out a sigh. So you did. They made this and they were but a little kid. And they told me that once they had a child, they would never wear such ugly things. Their words. He lowers his fist and looks towards the entrance to the village. I mean, it's not such a bad trinket. Uh, I trust... It's elegant, you know? Well, we had a deal and you did your part. Uh, thanks. I think. He puts an open palm on his forehead and closes his eyes. Once he notices that the wolf's head obstructs his fingers, he takes it off. Vashel liked this head. His voice is empty. He told me he'd get an even larger one. I... He looks at you. There's tears in his eyes, yet his voice is absent. <sighs> yes, we had a deal. I'll join you on your own adventure when the time comes. But I need to first close this ordeal. You ask him what he needs, but he puts on his hood and quirks his lips into a shadow of a smile. Nothing from you, friend. I already spoke with the others. The wood is ready for a pyre. We've meat to roast. You did a lot for our little tribe, and we'd love to see you at our table. There may be some tears amongst us, but there will be laughter, songs, and enough of Foggy's casks to forget about a thing or two. I can't promise anything, but... You suddenly realise the opportunity at hand. A group of vulnerable day souls may open their ears to your requests. If you're on their good side and know enough about them, it'll be a perfect moment to offer them a, a covenant with Hovlevin. I'm sure I can speak spare an evening. I assume it's Ella who's preparing it. I'll speak with him when I'm ready. Uh, just don't keep us waiting for too long, I. I may be in your debt, but I want to pull. I put all of this behind me. Focus on what's to come. Uh, good hunting. Right, would you like to... Oh, you won't buy shit off me. Hmm. I was asking about the merchants. The hunters push away the beasts, but it's not safe enough for us to keep roaming from here to there on a whim. But you're right, Road Warden. I'm just a farm with a past. During the pause that follows, a cold gust of wind ruffles your cloak. It's Foggy who speaks with the travels and merchants, knows how to price wares and labour. We need both her place and her experience, but you know how these roads are. When we need to resupply, we send the whole expedition with a cart, not a lonely peddler. Alright, see you later. What did that say, sorry? Ah, you don't have a room for me to rent. Sure. Uh, oh my god. Let's talk about the patrols you want to pay me for. No, let's talk about the funeral rites. We won't start the fires before dusk, he puts away his tools. Our hearts are ready, but are you sure you have time, friend? I, I am. Come, I'll help you with the food. He stands up with a smile and leads you to the House of Gatherings. We talk about this and that. The rites take little time and go by without prayers, singing or sacrifices. The family members share their memories and regrets. Every story you hear is vague yet accompanied by understanding nods and looks shared amongst the tribe, as well as chuckles and tears that start long before conclusion. After the years you spent in Halverven, it's hard for you to imagine how familiar and intimate all of the people around you are. Even Foggy and his staff are paying a visit. This evening, the tavern is closed. You now sit at the table and find the... Sorry, and the first meals are brought out. The bowls are mostly filled with meat, but it's the humble loaves of bread, slices of cheese, herb sauces, smoked fish, and wild fruits that disappear first. The warmth of the bonfire is reaching your hands and face, comforting you whenever a cold gust of wind hits the square. I need to be a little bit careful with my stony arm right now. If those rocks get hot, 
Oh boy, that's going to burn me. The bone airing instantly vanishes amongst the logs. The belt buckle is disappearing in a growing pile of ash. The bones you collected are crackling hauntingly from the heat. But that doesn't stop the cooks from piercing chunks of game meat with long sticks and holding them in the flames. There are maybe no priests, but I share the solemnity of the moment. Oh, full food. Holy mother of God. I, I got plus four food for that. The wood cracks beneath the flames. You've never seen the village of Creeks as quiet as it is now. But the way the locals face their mourning is anything but lonely. Pats on the backs or hands are common. As well as long embraces and whispered condolences. As time goes on, more and more people rest on the stools and chairs. Though there are a few exceptions. An old man with no legs is lying on a blanket, served by a girl who seems to be his great-granddaughter. One of the hunters steps away to get back on the watchtower, keeping an eye out for any being that may be lured by the noises. Shoshi is sitting in front of the building, singing about the forests of the past and the gardens of tomorrow. The cooks are bustling about, bringing supplies from the House of Gatherings and taking care of the roasting meat. Most of the children are only half awake. As for the cup, that's right, as the cups get filled with meat, ale, and cider brought here by Foggy, Efren is the first person to sit down next to you and loudly, though he's still observing the flames. His wolf cloak is nowhere in sight, though from time to time he reaches towards his head, as if he's not used to the wind brushing his black hair, now shining in the dancing light. Judging by the way he sways and how absent his eyes are, he opens. One of the casks a few hours back. How are you holding up? I'm using my privilege of being still alive to heal. He starts with confidence, but then his voice cracks. <sighs> Folks say I did nothing wrong, but, you know, I could have, you know, said no, stop them. And I've seen how, what's her face? Dahlia's little sis looks at me. She's only 10 and now alone. I'm as useful as a spirit. Once you figure out what he's talking about, you try to respond, but he interrupts you by pointing at you with his mug. And now I'm in your dead eye. We're going on a journey, his eyes shifting into anger. I was losing my wits waiting for this evening. They kept me for so long waiting. Can't you see those who are my friends? As he rambles, his thoughts wander off somewhere else. And before he gets back to you, Ella gives him a pat on his back and places a full mug in front of you. I smell the contents before I drink anything. I better chug it. I'm not getting drunk tonight. You know what? I'm not getting drunk tonight. Your call, but at least taste it. It is too good to go to waste. He smiles to you. But then the mug appears in the hunter's hands, and all that remains for the carpenter is to sigh with resignation. He grabs himself a stump and drinks from his own wooden mug. All three of you stare into the flames, hardly noticing a few more tribes that were gathered behind you. The carpenter breaks the silence. How are you doing, Andalono? Life's been treating you good in the peninsula. I've had some good days of making progress. Every day is a struggle. I feel stuck. It's a savage place, Ella. I'm just trying to survive, or I don't even think about it. I'll start living once I'm done with what I need to do. I'm making progress. I've had some good days. We're making progress. Wonderful. He strokes his stomach and meets your eyes. Just don't disappear like a Hysterion. He'd rather chase after something his whole life than walk away from, uh, walk away with Lil. Not unlike me, but also he tilts his mug, pointing the mouth of it at the flames. Not unlike them. After a few moments, you realize that almost all the adults are gathered behind you, observing you keenly. As the tension rises, you think about your blade now resting by your saddlebags. It's Ella who asks the question. We owe you a lot, Andalono. Why do you really help us? Hovlin wants to reach this land. For your own sake, you should join it. Taxes for their protection, loyalty for the renewed trading route. I have to answer it. Old Havel is right, says one of the farmers. So that's why they sent the second one, as a woodcutter. The fuss stops as quickly as it started, cut by the loud voice of a drunken Ephraim. Let the road warden make a case for it! You glance at the eyes of the locals. Some of them are distrustful. Others are curious and a few are excited. Even though you already recognise many of those faces, the dancing flames make them look like a strange crowd awaiting a prophecy. An old druid on the opposite side of the peninsula told me about the recent migrations of beasts in the north. 
You've been struggling with monsters for decades now. It's finally time for you to seek allies. I've seen your tools, weapons, houses. You need iron, you need copper. Hovland will help you gain steel, bronze, and brass. I know you don't have as many supplies as you need. Depending on animals you keep alive, the butcher is not a safe way to deal with winters. You don't really believe this wall will keep you safe, do you? Without a forest garden, you lack wood, and you can't afford stone. You need proper guards to protect your homes and lumberjacks. Your blood is growing thick. You can seek new sh settlers amongst city folk, or use the safer routes to find willing people at other villages. You want to grow crops, but you have no experience. With the city's help, you may hire a specialist to teach you everything you need to know and invest in the best seeds. You know how dangerous this land is. I brought you evidence that I found three of your finest hunters fallen by beasts. You can't afford more losses, and you can see the city folk can get things done. Sooner or later, a plague will reach your village. Living in isolation will postpone this day. But once it comes, how can you know help will ever come? Your best chance is to keep people like me around. Just look how much work I was able to complete at the Eastern Path. You can't keep it clear all by yourself, but with the city's army and regular merchant trips, it will endure winters and rains. This is the best option I've seen so far. The Zen 2, which I believe are gambles. It's risky, but you know me well. I have your trust. I wouldn't try to trick you, or maybe I shouldn't try it, but... Foggy, won't you vouch for me? I know I'm a valuable ally, and the tribe depends on your tavern. The city will bring many more people to help you. How about this one? They will give you more people along the eastern path. Ella eagerly agrees. Your horsemanship got you further than any of us for a long time. One of the hunters interrupts him. But you can see that the road warden has never helped us for our sake, aye? They're the city's spy. The carpenter gives him a long look then carries on slowly. Spy or not, Andalona's past efforts will change our future. And I'm willing to see what else a single road warden can do. Not to mention a squad of soldiers. Oh, so I can do multiple ones. Uh, let's mention about the old druid. This was probably my second choice. Beasts don't enter our valley, says one of the hunters, but it's quickly shushed. Yet, as one-handed far sorry, after one-handed farmer harshly, while a herbalist with wavy hair points at the bonfire, and even if it's turning into a prison. Some of the locals nod in agreement, but old Haver's tone is far from docile. Better to have a troll in your yard than a dragon in your bed. Okay. Uh, how about your blood is also growing thick? You're going to need other settlers. A skinny farmer s a snickers. Do you address our blood or our loins? A few yeah, very... Oh my god. How witty. A few of the locals chuckle, but even though the scarcity of food is brought up, most of the locals seem to agree it's a problem that needs to be addressed sooner rather than later. Yeah, I'm trying to stop you all in breeding here. I don't want to threaten with a plague. I hate the end of this one. I like the, how dangerous the land is. But I don't like the city folk can get things done. You want to grow crops but you have no experience. I think this is the next best one. Old Harbour is quick to mention the fine grain will cost much more than the seeds of wild fruits and vegetables. But as soon as she finishes, one of the hunters confronts her. However, you don't always know how to plant these seeds. I've heard about the plant beds having nothing but grass for more than a year. As he mentions it, the other farmers observe their boots as if to avoid their angry headwoman. Once the argument between the two gets a bit too bitter, Efren nudges you to go on. Uh, you're going to need metals. A dark-skinned builder crosses her arms. We've got no smiths either. No furnaces, no place to learn. You mentioned that there are always items looking for work. Apprentices, maybe, Foggy corrects you. At least you may be sure that you'll have enough arms to assist your labour and enough years left to stay with you for a long time. Or well, let's figure out the smiths if you can buy the tools and blades instead of alloys. No. I think the first one's better still. Yeah, you'll, you'll have enough arms to assist your labour. You note approving looks amongst the youth. Fresh blood is of value, says the forager, and Ellen encourages him with a smile. And after what I've heard about the city guilds, I don't think an apprentice would be a lazy good for nothing. Do I have to click all of these? Is this where we're going to get to? Uh Hmm... Do 
Do you think this wall will keep you safe, I guess, is the next one I'd go with? Oh, wall has been good so far, starts one of the farmers. But his partner now holding an arm around his back is more doubtful. We've lost children, chicken, and food to smaller beasts. We don't have enough eyes to watch everything. Ella chips in with enthusiasm. If we hope to grow our families or invite new folks, we'll need more homes, more ground, a new wall. I'd rather it be a strong one. Still, some of the locals would rather see more effort put into the new fields rather than a wall. One bad fire in the forest and we go hungry, mentioned the forager, and a few others agree. Yeah, food supplies, that's the problem now. Some of them don't meet your eyes as if to avoid admitting to the days of hunger. Ephraim lets out a sigh. At the beginning of summer, I'd say, he pauses to break through the cloud of drink. We had more hunters than ever, but he takes a glance at the bonfire and turns back to the crowd quickly, clenching his teeth. Ella observes him for a moment, but doesn't comment on his behaviour. We do have a field now. It may not be so bad. The rest of the tribe adds to both sides of the argument, though no conclusion is reached. I don't want to go with the plague. Uh, I hate this. I You can see city folk get things done. Honestly, I'm going to do the random roll. Foggy will vouch for me. She frowns. After a long moment, she raises her only arm and gestures for you to stop. You're asking the wrong soul, dear. You're my client, and that's it. In an awkward silence, you think about the next move. It's risky, but you know me well. I have your... Tr Okay, dangerous land, I guess. Aye, friend, you've proven your bravely, adds one of Dali's sisters, though her voice is weak. You mentioned the city's soldiers, artisans, pathfinders, and scholars, but one of the younger foragers chips in. I'm priest, she whispers, and the crowd exchanges worried looks. All right, plague will reach your village. If you're so eager, maybe it's you who should stay around, mentions Shoshi. But herbalist friend shakes her head. We need not one soul, but a way to find many in its place. Plagues are stronger than one shell and will. Even though she says so, and many in the tribe give you warm smiles. I have nothing more to add. Quest completed to support the creeps. Wonderful. Then it's time for the discussion of the vote, announces Ella, gesturing for everyone to form a circle, and Foggy agrees. And fast we wake up early. I want to reach the tavern soon after sunrise. Oh, and love, she looks at you with a wolf-like grin. Better take care of that before it burns. She points to a piece of roasting mouflon. The next few minutes you listen to a lively discussion, but it turns out to be rather one-sided, and most of the doubts get buried by pointed replies and references to your previous deeds. Finally, the voting occurs, and it takes no scribe to spot many more hands raised for the eye side. I stand up. There's no clapping or cheerful shouts. Ella spreads his arms, lit by the glow of the bonfire. We will meet the city folk and negotiate the terms. The shadow of his words spreads above the old untamed past of the tribe, and the grief follows. Nevertheless, a few of the locals approach you to share good words, and to wish you a safe journey to the city. Some hope you'll bring back a few gifts. The feast continues with heavy souls, but the tension leaves your shell. All you have left is a heavy eyelids and some time to kill. I can relax with my gambling friends. I'll talk to Ella about the future. You wake up on a pile of furs after a few hours, still thinking about the feast and your conversations with the carpenter. He didn't take much interest in your pursuits, but some of his aspirations are admirable. While many will most likely never happen, at least not in a single lifetime. It had been quite a few days since you had the opportunity to participate in a conversation during which there was nothing to win or lose. The long walk you took between the building and the fields allowed you to observe the stars at a later hour than usual. Now, there are loud conversations coming from the main square, where people are sitting with plates of cold meat and bowls of gruel, chatting about the plans for the day. Some of them wish you a great day. There are loud conversations coming from the main square where people are sitting with plates of cold meat and bowls of gruel, chatting about the plans for the day. Okay. A little bit of a, a typo there, but that's fine. Honestly, there's been so few in the game, I'm kind of impressed. But just a little accidental duplication of the sentence. Shannon is well rested and satisfied with grass. I have a day to spare. I asked to see if any locals need protection on the roads. Ah. 
God, it's day 76, by the way. Let's talk about the patrols he wanted to pay me for. His carving slows down slightly. What's the matter, friend? I know from old Hayu that your tribe needs to contact with Foggy more than I need your coin. Two dragons for a day isn't enough. He thinks about your words for a few months before he surrenders. So be it. Three it is. Alright, see you later. Apparently I've just made more money. Uh, does anyone need protection? A big delivery. Uh, I will gain food. I potentially will lose some health. Sure. I will work for three dragons. Oh, perfect. That was really nice. And now... Oh my god, it's like the end of the day. And I can't sleep here, right? How long to... 30 minutes. Okay, we'll have a little wash in the stream. I step away. So I think I've done this one now as well. Oh. Before you cross the bridge, you're told to wait by Ella. There's one more thing, friend. Ever since we said farewell to our hunting friends and siblings, the tribe of Creek Seas were lacking fresh blood, and that we got too cocky with these woods and roads. If you think this is a good place for you, his dramatic pause is betrayed by the shaking lips of his concealed, concealed smile. You could stay with us for however long you like. We already voted on it. And to be honest, you're quite popular. <laughs> his laughter is so honest you can't help but feel the warmth in your stomach. That sounds... I'd love that, friend, but I need to finish a few things first. I need some time to think. I'm honoured and grateful, but I have to refuse. You misconstrued my motives to help you, Ella. I have an exciting life ahead of me and I'm not going to get tied to a little hamlet like yours or care to elaborate. You know what? I'm honoured and grateful, but I'm going to refuse. We want to retire on the version of Coco Cabana Beach with pina coladas and a sack full of dragon bones. He skips a breath, but I thought... He clenches his jacket and bites his upper lip, fighting with the words he wants to say. I respect your decision and honesty. Good luck on the road. The last few words reach you when he's already turned away, approaching the gate. Farewell. Man, I've just not been able to get too glousier. Uh, we're going to sleep here, by the way. Will I rent a room? I don't really need to. Although it will cost me a heart. So I think I will rent. I've got 12 dragon bones right now. Uh... Okay, the fish is rotted. Who would have thought that? Svi, how much does he want? Ten dragons. Right, very well, you can take my ten dragons. I think I'm committing. Admittedly, I'm kind of doing this for you, the viewer, right now. I think, personally, if I were the Road Warden, and I guess I am kind of trying to play it as me being the Road Warden, I don't think I would go to High Island. I think I would have just... I've helped the people I want to help at this point, honestly. I think I would just leave. And I almost considered it while I was talking to the Creeks. Because, realistically, other than maybe Gale Rocks, where I've not really got to this, you know... You're completely loved by the Gale Rocks yet. I think i have kind of happy with what I've done with other people. So I could just earn money and leave. And I'd be, feel pretty content about things. But I feel like I'd be missing so much of the game going, not going to the, the uh, what's it called? The High Island. So I think I'm going to do that. I think I've kind of accepted now that I've screwed up something with the monastery pathway. Probably accepting the quest screwed me over. I thought I'd be able to lie through it, but I guess you can't. So I would like to learn more about that. And I think I have to deal with the guy to get to Glaucia's band. So maybe we'll go through the center of the map at some point and try and deal with that as well. I didn't mean to go to the pier, by the way, either. Uh, take me back to the Gale Rocks. I just want to have a chat with some people here. I also think I made a slight mistake about the Lost Merchants. I haven't found them yet, and I don't think anyone will. Uh, I'll tell you if I learn anything. Farewell. I, I think I may have messed up that event with the Fallen Tree, where you, you know, you had to CSI the scene. I think I fucked up. I think if I did that right, it would have given me a path to find where the traders were. But now that I've cleared up that area because of the Creek's quest, 
I think I've locked myself out of doing that. So the only other thought is that I find Glaucia's bands and they have the trader stuff on them. But I kind of think that will lead me to certain death. So I think what I'm going to do next time, because I'm going to end this episode, I think, here now. Do you have anything out of interest? Uh, no. I think what I'm going to do next episode, and I think we're going to approach potentially a, a series ending point. So I'm just going to give you that word of warning now. I think I'm going to go through the center of the map again and try and find this guy again that, you know, was calling out to me. And I'm going to purposely fall into his trap because I think it is Glaucia's band. And then we'll see what routes we get from that. If it leads to my death, I will go to alternate timeline again. And I think instead, because I think I've kind of fucked up that quest line, I think what I'll do is I'll just take my people that I've got now and go to High Island. And if we die on High Island, I think that will then just be the end of the series. Because I imagine that all that happens if you, you know, leave via the front gate, as so to speak, we go all the way back to the the pelt, talk to Julia there, and she says, like, we've done with her adventure, is we'll just get, like, a score screen or something, just saying, like, this is what you did, this is what you didn't do. Which would be really interesting, but I, I think we want to explore as much of this game as possible. I've really enjoyed it, and I just want to see more. I'm also intrigued how this is, like, so broken up. Maybe I could find other things. I don't know if you can fill in, like, all the black spaces. Who knows? Anyway... That'll do it for now. So next time we go into the center of the map again. If you've enjoyed this episode, why don't you leave a like and subscribe if it helps me out. And I'll see you on the next part. Goodbye.